Hi, this is Dr. Wallace J. Nichols, and welcome to my Blue Mind keynote. I'm going to explain this idea that we call Blue Mind that connects us to our water. I hope you enjoy it. I'm going to explain how this idea of Blue Mind can change the way you understand yourself and the way you perceive the world around us. I'm going to walk you through the science and the practice of Blue Mind and help you connect it to your life and the lives of those around you, as well as our efforts to protect and restore our little blue marble planet. So let's start here. This, the overview is three parts. I'm gonna talk about gratitude and why we share gratitude in the first place. I'm gonna talk about transforming cultures and how we save sea turtles through cultural transformation. And I wanna talk about, uh, for the, the bulk of this presentation, how we're changing the way we value water and oceans. We're changing the way people perceive that value equation. So uh, let's begin with just a simple iconic symbol, which is this blue marble. This marble represents uh, the view of our little water planet. If you hold this marble out at arm's length, uh, it, that's what we look like from a million miles away. And when we give you a marble, it's just a simple reminder that we all share this little water planet. It's our home. It's a little small gesture of gratitude. Uh, I like to ask everyone I meet a simple question. What's your water? What's the water that you dream about when you're not there? What's the water you long for, you long to get back to? And when did you fall in love with your water? When was that first time that you really connected and you realized that it was a special place that you like to spend time? And who took you to your water? Who is your guide? Maybe it was a friend, a neighbor, a sibling, uh, a teacher. Who was the person who introduced you to the water that you love so much? So this conversation about Blue Mind is uh, universal, but it's also deeply personal. Everybody has an individual water story. For some people, their relationship with water is all about hydration and hygiene. There are a billion people on the planet who have to walk to get their water daily. Now that's a chore, but it is also uh, filled with joy. There's an enjoyable quality to bringing water into your household. For some people, their relationship with water is through the food they eat and the water they drink, through agriculture. We need water to grow uh, the food that nourishes us. And people work all day, all over the world, uh, using water and plants to create food. For some people, their water is also recreation. Uh, it can be a, a fun activity like uh, white water rafting or canoeing or kayaking. For some people, it's stand up paddle boarding. It's, you know, paddling on that flat water or rowing uh, in the early morning hours. So many people engage with their water. Uh, as an athletic pursuit as well. When we do these things with the people we love, with our families and friends, it brings us closer together. So for a lot of people, that question, what's your water, involves uh, fellow, fellow humans, our, our, our loved ones and our families. Maybe your water uh, is all about learning a new experience. Maybe it's about learning to surf, learning to swim, learning to dive, uh, stretching your boundaries, and getting in maybe a slight bit of discomfort and doing a completely new activity. Um, when you learn a new activity, your brain grows and you connect with the people you learn with. For some people, the experience of Blue Mind involves other species. Maybe you're on the bow of a boat or a ship and these animals come to visit. Whenever dolphins come and bow ride, if you've ever had that experience, everybody on the boat moves to the bow everybody is happy and then after the dolphins decide it's time to leave uh, everybody stays happy there's something uh, really joyous and really engaging and emotionally satisfying about spending time on the water with other forms of life maybe you've been submerged completely underwater and had an experience eye to eye with an animal a fish a sea lion a turtle or a whale like this my friend Brian Scary, the photographer, uh, took this shot and I think it's absolutely stunning. Every time I looked at, look at it, it takes me, uh, takes me there, it takes me into my blue mind. So blue mind can also be an urban experience. This is downtown 
uh, Austin, Texas, Barton Springs. This is a beloved swimming hole, swimming pool, where people from all over the city spend time recreating, particularly in the very hot summer. Uh, so Blue Mind isn't about tropical oceans only. Uh, it isn't about whitewater rafting only. It's also about the time we spend with our water in cities. And throughout our lives, our water reflects back to us the changes that occur, both metaphorically and literally. So you can see as your life changes, you can see those changes reflected back into the, in the waters around you through the seasons. Blue Mind is all about water, and sometimes that water is in the form of ice and snow. Uh, Blue Mind and water can be liquid, solid, or gas. We can be inspired by clouds, by fog, by snow and ice, by lakes, rivers, and oceans. For a lot of people, their Blue Mind is achieved at the edge of the water while really relaxing and just taking a break from our busy, red-minded lives. And we'll talk about that a lot shortly. For some people, it really is uh, a more domesticated experience. Um, their water is the indoor kind. Maybe it's a pool or a tub, a shower or a spa. Jack Black, he likes to kick back with his puppy and enjoy a nice leisurely bath when he's stressed. And for some people, it really is as simple as a, a drinking fountain, a sip of water, a glass of water uh, when they're thirsty that reconnects them and grounds them, it hits their reset button. Wherever you are across the world, across the US, you're never far away from water. This isn't a coastal story. This isn't just a Great Lakes story. This is a story for every single human being. Wherever you live, wherever you're spending your time, there's water nearby you that you should connect to. So for me personally, my Blue Mind story involves my father. He was the one who took us to the water. He's the one who taught us to swim, taught us to dive. His love of water translated into the lives of his kids. And I would say my water is in fact a man named Dad. And I was lucky enough to be able to explore both the coasts as well as the lakes of our country. Uh, when I was 11 years old, spending time at this lake in Wyoming, uh, really set these memories deeply in, in my life. I, I can remember that moment standing there with that animal drinking her water by the side of this cold lake. I can remember the feel of the grass. I can remember the smell of the air. I can remember the taste of the trout that we caught in the lake. I can remember jumping into that icy cold water every morning to take a bath. And I felt like the best version of myself at 11 years old standing right there. And I have to say, I think those kinds of experiences uh, create who we become. And I became a marine biologist because of my love of water. But at 11 years old, I really had a passion for uh, not mountain lakes, but for sea turtles. And this is the best photo I have of myself with a turtle. That's me on the left and a snapping turtle on the right. Uh, we used to catch snapping turtles in the Chesapeake Bay we would paint numbers on their shells and throw them back uh, into the bay. And sometimes we recapture them. And it was kind of a fun game for a group of 11 and 12 year olds. Uh, we'd use simple math to try to figure out how many turtles were in that part of the bay. And I'd say the, the science was a little bit shaky, but we were learning ab about our love for nature. We were learning about water. We were learning about wildlife. And that connection, that, that, um, that passion, that dream, of being a biologist stuck with me. And I, I carried forward kind of this, I would say a slight obsession for sea turtles. In fact, uh, I see them sometimes where they actually aren't occurring. So this rock formation to me looks like a sea turtle. Some people might just see, or see some rocks there. Um, but as a, a young grad student, one of the first things I did was I attached a satellite transmitter uh, to the shell of a turtle named Adelita. Uh, Adelita was a 223 pound loggerhead sea turtle that had been raised in captivity in Mexico, in Baja California, Mexico. And it was time for her to leave. She had been in a tank for 10 years. We got the transmitter, we epoxied it to her shell, and we released her into the ocean. And in this short video, you can see uh, as she enters the water, she begins to swim. And at 
a, a moment about the distance from the boat that her tank was wide, she pauses, and this will loop around again. You can see she, she swims a little bit, enters the water and swims a little bit, and then she pauses as if to say, where's the wall? There's been a wall right about here for, for 10 years. Finding no wall, she continues to swim often into the, the distant water. And I think there's a lot to learn biologically from these animals and from Adelita's story, but there's also a, a powerful metaphor there. So we all have imaginary walls that hold us back, that keep us from reaching our goals and, and our dreams, that hold us in our tank. And just like this turtle, we need to swim through those imaginary walls to figure out uh, where we're headed and to reach our goals, to, to find our, our calling and our purpose. And so for Adelita, this was swimming through a wall that opened up the entire North Pacific. Uh, once she made that move, she continued to swim 7,000 miles across the entire North Pacific Ocean. She didn't stop at all for a break. It took her 368 days. So you could say that this turtle's purpose was to go across the entire ocean. This was the first animal ever tracked across an entire ocean basin. The first one ever tracked swimming across an ocean. We put her data on the internet live and kids all over the planet started following her. And this was 1996 when the internet was new. And we were told, don't put the data online. People will steal it. People will steal your turtle data. And I remember thinking, what will they do with stolen turtle data? And I, I couldn't think of anything. So we continued to share the data. And by sharing what we were learning openly and freely, we created a movement. We created a sea turtle movement. And people around the world begin to understand that to save these animals re would require international collaboration, good science, and a lot of long-term hard work. And so Adelita really started an ocean revolution. She started a, a sea turtle movement that has led to the, the saving of sea turtle species. She also taught us a lot about the North Pacific Ocean and the plastic pollution that's out there. But what she really taught us was the importance of swimming through those imaginary walls and the importance of sharing passionately and freely and widely. So the question that comes from this Adelita story is, what walls have you swum through in the past? And probably even more importantly, what walls do you need to swim through? What are the imaginary walls that you've created that are holding you back from achieving your potential, from reaching your goals, from fixing what's broken, uh, from solving big problems. Uh, who's stopping you? Is it yourself? Uh, are they real walls or are they the ones that you make up in your head? And so going back to the sea turtle story, what I also learned from these turtles is that collaboration is key. A heartful, uh, honest, um, dignified, trust-based collaboration, such as building relationships with former turtle hunters like Chewy Lucero, and Juan de la Cruz Villalejos. These men are now the greatest sea turtle protectors I know, and they started out being the quote unquote enemies of sea turtles. So building um, new kinds of collaborations, breaking through the walls that separate us and finding common ground to solve problems is incredibly important. So these turtles have taught us so many lessons in the process of working to understand their biology and save them from extinction. And so that is a key takeaway message from, from my work with sea turtles that I wanted to share with you. I've made some of my best friends uh, by working with sea turtles, and I've learned some of my greatest life lessons by working with these animals. Really what we've learned is that we are made of the same stuff as each other. We're made of the same stuff as these animals. We're made of the same stuff as the life around us. Uh, there isn't really a separation between any of us. Uh, we're going to the same place, we came from the same place, and we're made of the same stuff. We depend on each other. And that sounds like maybe more spiritual than a biological message, but in fact, it's both. So this work uh, took me out of the realm of biology, and I began to get curious about how do we really solve problems? If conservation is all about behavior change, what do we know about behavior? What do we need to know about behavior in order to do conservation? So having laws, having good policies, and having science 
uh, isn't enough. Uh, using the economic tools and the ecological tools and the educational tools is not enough. We need to understand the science of emotion. And that led me to hang out and start asking questions of people called neuroscientists and psychologists, people who study the human brain, people who study the neurons that make up our brain. And so that science became incredibly useful in a field that I call neuroconservation. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a bit. But let's go back. The, the early understanding of uh, human decision science and the human brain and the mind was based on this idea of a black box where you could stimu stimulate someone and then measure what they did in response to that simulation. But you couldn't see what was going on inside the box. It's, these are the black box model. And then that's how things went along for, for a very long time. And if you did get the chance to look inside that black box, it was typically after people were done using their brain, if you get what I'm saying there. Uh, that's how neuroscience went along for hundreds of years. Um, after people were done with their brain, after they passed away, scientists could look at the brain, measure the anomalies, measure the injuries, and map those to the human behavior of the person while they were alive. And so the early textbooks on neuroscience were based entirely on post-mortem analysis. But that all changed when we got the technology that has allowed us to look inside the human brain while we're still using it. So measuring electricity in the brain using EEGs or measuring the flow of oxygen in the brain using fMRI brain scanners. So this combination of, of a technology that allows us to look at the brain while it's still in use doing a whole range of things has really opened up the conversation about human behavior in a remarkable way. And really, this has been over the last two decades. So we're able to ask questions uh, about how a brain at rest compares to a brain in motion, how a brain doing an activity compares to a brain, say, meditating and being calm, uh, how a brain under stress and an anxious brain compares to a calm, centered, focused brain. Very different and very interesting questions. We've even gotten to the point where we can ask questions about emotions like love. Love is a, actually a complex set of emotions that involves a suite of neurochemicals like serotonin, oxytocin, and dopamine in different mixes. So now scientists are able to talk about love, happiness, awe, and wonder. This is absolutely transformative and it's helping us understand ourselves better and more every single week. We now know that oxytocin, the chemical oxytocin, is the basis of building trust between individuals. And this is true throughout all mammals. Oxytocin is a key chemical in dictating our social relationships and our emotional attachments. So the cover of magazines like Scientific American is now featuring things like meditation. 20 years ago, this was completely unimaginable, but now it's the norm. We're beginning to say, Let's take our scientific methodology and apply it to things that were completely off limits, like love, meditation, insight, creativity. Neuroscientists are working with pro meditators. They're hooking them up and sticking them in brain scanners and asking questions about how does the brain meditate? How does the brain get calm? And what happens? What capabilities and capacities are enhanced under those circumstances? Now, I don't know about you, but if you ask me, putting all those nodes all over my head would not make me feel very relaxed. But this man is the Michael Jordan of meditation, so he can chill out even with 78 uh, EEG nodes glued all over his head and his face. And what we're learning is that the brain at rest, in fact, doesn't shut off. It turns on in a completely different way that opens us up to insight, to a feeling of oneness, with ourselves and each other and our planet, and massive amount of creativity. And this is super important to solving the biggest problems we face uh, for ourselves and for our planet. There's been a, a wave of books about applied neuroscience that have hit the bestseller list. You can go to the library or the bookstore and you'll find books about just about every topic connecting 
uh, economics and neuroscience, happiness and neuroscience, creativity and the arts with psychology and neuroscience, even magic and neuroscience, understanding how magicians fool us into thinking they can do things they can't. There's a book about that. It's a wide range, Music and the Brain by Oliver Sacks, Musicophilia, tremendously uh, useful book. Nobel Prizes are being won by scientists who study applied neuroscience. This team won a Nobel Prize figuring out how we make mental maps, how you find your car when you parked it in a new place, how you make that mental map that allows you to get back to that place. It isn't stored in the sky. It isn't stored in the cloud. That mental map is in your head. And this team won the Nobel Prize figuring out how we make those, those internal GPS or GIS systems. So in summary, we are living in what I would call the golden age of neuroscience. There's no more interesting time to be alive in the history of studying our own mind and our brain. Every week there's a new breakthrough that is extremely useful to you in the process of being you. And, and the big message here is that it's up to us to become neuroliterate. It's up to us to understand this science so we can apply it to our own lives. Because if we don't, somebody else will use the science and use it to manipulate us or to encourage us to do things that we may not really want to do. So it's up to each of us to understand ourselves and to become neuroliterate. And that's the broad goal of Blue Mind is neuroliteracy and understanding our connection to the world around us, the connection of our nervous system to the world around us and using that as a force for good. So this is the first generation to have a decent user's manual, user's guide to our own brain. Think about that. Imagine the generations that came before us that had no idea how our own brain actually worked. They really were pretty clueless. And imagine the utility and the power of the breakthrough science that puts this knowledge into our own hands. And it's up to us to read the user's manual. It's up to us to use it and leverage it as a force for good. So years ago, when I was a kid, this book called Jaws came out and it had a big emotion appeal. It scared the heck out of people. It created a, a fight or flight response. I would call that red mind. It scared people out of the ocean, scared me out of lakes, pools, rivers. I was even afraid to get in the bathtub as a kid. This, this book and the subsequent film uh, created such a, an emotional response in people that still people talk about it to this very day. But now there's a wave of books that are luring people back into nature that are saying, get in the water because it's good for you. Get in the water because it makes you a better person. Go into the forest, spend time in nature and hit the big reset button. And that's what Blue Mind is all about. It's about sharing the understanding of how being outside in motion together makes us better versions of ourselves. And this is a field I call neuroconservation because when we connect neuropsychology with conservation biology, uh, it's powerful. It's a huge lever to help both human health as well as the health of nature. When we understand that nature is medicine, that water is medicine, that healthy ecosystems make healthy brains, healthy minds, healthy bodies, healthy communities. Wow, that's a powerful world-changing idea. So as a, a student, as a grad student, as, as I studied economics and ecology and education, uh, I was told these are three very important realms for the work that I do, but was always left out all the way through the 24th grade those 24 years of schooling that I went through, the emotional piece, the science of emotion was completely left out of the conversation. So what I like to say is we need to include emotion, the fourth E, but we need to elevate it to the top of the list because the science of emotion is probably the foundation of the entire conversation. Marketers know this, politicians know this, and now conservation and healthcare problem solvers need to understand this. The more emotionally engaged your health provider, your doctor, your nurse, the more emotionally engaged they are with your wellness, the better your healing process is going to be. This is also true for nature. 
And I'd like to say that emotional wellness drives sustainability, right? There is no chance that we will achieve sustainability in any way, shape or form as an individual, as a family, as a team, as a business, as a society. Sustainability is out of reach unless we have emotional wellness. And you probably recognize this uh, in yourself, in your own family, in your own community, but it's true at the macro level as well. So let's back up a little bit. Why is it so important to take care of our emotional wellness? Well, what we've seen these past few years from the American Psychological Association is that we are in peak anxiety mode right now. According to the APA, Americans are feeling the highest levels of stress that they've ever measured, stress and anxiety. That's not good, that's a bad thing. And we see that it's affecting all generations, especially the younger generations. So back when I was in high school, we didn't carry the kinds of stressors that young people carry now. There's a whole range of, of anxiety and stressors that be, can become debilitating. And so the, the American Psychological Association has been studying this stuff nationally for a long time. And they've issued the warning that we've got, a, we've got an epidemic of stress and anxiety that we can't ignore. We can't just say, oh, let's just medicate it or let's ignore it. I'm a, a dad of two teenage daughters, so I pay particular attention to the literature uh, on, on young women and their um, susceptibility to the stress that things like social media can cause. And when that stress and anxiety is left unchecked, it eventually leads to depression. Uh, that's the move from red mind to gray mind. Uh, so we, need, we do really need to be talking about these issues. And Blue Mind is one of the solutions. It's one of the tools for our, our toolbox. So we'll connect the dots back to anxiety and stress uh, and Blue Mind in a minute. But it's important to understand that according to medical health researchers, 60% of diseases, illnesses, and disorders are caused by or made worse, exacerbated by stress and anxiety, 60%. So when we say we're, we're talking about stress and anxiety, this is a massive public health conversation that impacts 60% of the reasons people end up at the doctor or in the hospital. 60%, not insignificant. So the world is getting busier, it's getting more connected, it's getting more distracted. There are more screens everywhere you look. There's probably one in your pocket. You're probably looking at one now. Uh, even when we take a break to go relax and we go out to dinner, our restaurants may have 15 TV screens, each playing a different sporting event, a different soundtrack, and just a, a cacophony of information and sound faces uh, and visual stimulation. That is not relaxing, but that is our new normal. Our new normal is busy is good. When you get a break, you need to be busy even when you have a break. We don't have an off switch. We, haven't, we've, we don't know where our off button is. And we, we may go to sleep and the last thing we do is we look at our phone, we wake up and the first thing we do is we look at it again. Uh, that's the new normal. That's the way modern humans are, are trying to, to live, trying to survive. And both neuroscientists and Zen practitioners call this state monkey mind. Uh, it's the constant chatter that's really difficult to turn off. We just keep going. And when we get a chance, we go even harder and more. Um, it does take its toll on us. And if we could go in and have that procedure done where the monkey was removed from our mind, I think a lot of people would sign up for it. But in fact, it doesn't exist. But there are other ways there are other non-surgical ways to remove the monkey from your mind. And that's what, that's what this conversation is all about, is connecting uh, red mind, that monkey mind, to solutions involving water. So even the monkeys have monkey mind these days, which is a problem, not just for the monkeys. So everywhere I travel to talk about Blue Mind, I see on the front page of the newspapers, in rural communities, in big cities, everywhere, all over the country, I find the same story, that people are trying to self-medicate to handle their monkey mind, 
to alleviate their red mind symptoms. And when they do that, they generally create worse situations. They create more red mind. They don't solve the problem, they make it worse. They make it worse for themselves, their families, their community, and the nation. Uh, so th that just underlines the need for this conversation. We've got an opioid crisis uh, that it's in the headlines. It's uh, talked about by politicians. It's talked about by um, the media. There are lawsuits. There are serious concerns about the overuse and the addiction to opioids as a response to people needing to try to relax, try to alleviate their pain and anxiety, but f choosing the wrong methodologies to do that, that just exacerbate the problem. At the extreme of the conversation about red mind is, is post-traumatic stress. Um, that's what happens after you've experienced a, a physical and mental stressor. Uh, oftentimes that can be a repetitive stressor um, that continues to haunt you, continues to physiologically impact your life. It's called post-traumatic stress. And a lot of people are carrying the, the burden of post-traumatic stress, not just military and first responders, but anyone who has experienced uh, serious trauma throughout their lives. So all of this together is what we call red mind, uh, this combination of anxiety, distraction, too much information, the always overconnected normal state of affairs with the occasional blunt or acute trauma that punctuates our lives. Uh, that is all in a, in a big ugly ball called red mind. And it's important to say that red mind is extremely useful. We need, we need to be agitated. We need to be afraid. We need to, we need to run faster. Um, we need that fight or flight response. That's why it exists in us. But if it's all we have all of the time, it will chew us up. It will burn us out. It will run us down. And we will move from red mind into what I call gray mind. Gray mind is the ashes. Gray mind is the burnout. Gray mind is pretty darn useless. Well, red mind is useful as long as you have it under control. Gray mind is completely useless. Uh, you're unmotivated, you're uninspired, uh, you're disconnected, uh, mildly or even severely depressed. And that can even become a, a clinical uh, situation that requires serious uh, medical attention. So when we communicate as environmentalists about the plight of the planet, we often just add more red mind to the lives of the people around us. We try to use the fight or flight response to get a response, to get a donation, to get a click or to get a vote. And that just simply adds more fear to the equation. Uh, we use fear, we use anger. We figure if we scare people into action, that'll work. If we yell at them, that'll work. Maybe we use shame and guilt as a motivator. Uh, these are all powerful emotional motivators, um, but they only work for a short period of time. They only get a short bump of a response. We love to overload people with facts. We love to heap on more statistics. So that combination of fear, anger, shame, and facts has not really solved the problems that we face. We need a bigger toolbox. Not to say that fear is not an important motivator, red mind is useful, but we need a bigger toolbox because this limited toolbox is not working for us. There's a new school of coaching. There's a new school of communication that includes blue mind, uh, includes positive emotions. Things like gratitude, saying thank you uh, when you should say thank you. Saying thank you to the people maybe you've never said thank you to and saying thank you like you mean it. Offering uh, some words of gratitude. Uh, I often reflect on this guy, Mr. Rogers, who kind of had the gratitude thing pretty well dialed in. Building trust. What's the science of trust? How do you build those trusted connections that allow people to know what you're thinking and for you to know what they're thinking so that you can collaborate more powerfully? How to build those connections. This is a photograph of, of my daughters, Grace and Julia. And a few minutes before I snapped that photo, they were in the car arguing and I thought somebody was gonna lose an eyeball. We got out of the car, we walked on the beach, and then suddenly they started holding hands, talking to each other probably about Justin Bieber, but that doesn't matter. Um, they 
rebuilt their connection. And something about moving outside, getting out of the confines of a cramped uh, car going down the highway and being out by the water helped them to, to refocus and to relax. Of course, love holds everything together. Uh, most scientists fear the word love. They won't say it uh, in an interview. They won't say it from a podium. They won't say it in a conference. But the science of love is incredibly important to this conversation. And without it, we're missing probably the best tool that we could possibly have. All of the people I know who have committed and devoted their lives to fixing what's broken do it because they fell in love with that animal that place or that idea that is what is motivating them that is what is making them unstoppable and it's that love that makes us strong and effective and adding wellness to our toolkit so explaining that a healthy environment that healthy lakes rivers and oceans and healthy nature is part of what makes us well uh, that builds wellness that maintains it this is a key piece of the blue mind message of connecting water to wellness and to health. And so we need to bring that into our toolbox. So gratitude, trust, love, and wellness are the new tools in the Blue Mind toolbox. Now, marketers have always known this. Coca-Cola sells sugar water by talking about happiness and love. This is nothing new. This is the way advertisers uh, get their job done. They connect to you through positive emotions. They don't use fear and anger and guilt and shame, and they rarely use a bombardment of facts. They almost always use positive, uh, deeply held emotions that connect us to their brand. And so what we're beginning to understand as scientists is that nature is medicine for those who need it most. That green space, uh, which is a fancy way of saying plants and forests and parks, are good for our mental and physical health. What we're also learning is that blue space the watery areas of the planet are even better. And the best thing is when you combine green space with blue space, that's the best. And so study after study is showing that spending time with blue space, it can even be uh, the sound of water, the sound of nature calms us, soothes us, boosts our creativity. It might even be um, virtual nature, it might even be photographs, films, VR, paintings, music about nature, music about water, uh, films about the ocean, they also help get us into this blue mind state. And the review studies that have taken all the clinical work and put it together and asked the question, is water medicine? Those studies come back with a resounding yes. There will be more research. It will most likely back up this basic idea that water is medicine for those who need it most and everyone else. But study after study continue to pile on to point in the same direction. Now this is basically an ancient idea that goes all the way back to the beginning of humanity. We've always known that water is life. Water is necessary for life. That water is sacred. Water should be revered. This has been depicted throughout our history through art and through literature. You find the, some of the great works of art depicting this emotional valence that we find in water and nature. People stood in line to stand in front of the great works of art throughout history and to feel this emotional connection to water. Uh, painters, modern painters, continue this tradition. It's Rand Ortner, a, a Brooklyn-based painter, who paints these giant triptychs, and it's just the surface of the ocean, and they're just absolutely stunning paintings to stand in front of and feel uh, moved by this virtual depiction of the ocean. This is a painting by my late brother-in-law, John Ember, and uh, he painted side by side with my sister, Jill, uh, throughout their adult lives. Uh, painting together was the basis of, of their relationship, uh, and they loved to paint the coast of Maine. And John passed away of, of ALS a few years ago, and as he w lost the ability to hold his paintbrush in his right hand, he switched it to his left hand, and when he could no longer hold it in his left hand, he held it in his mouth. Uh, when he could no longer hold it in his mouth, they taped it to his head and he painted this, one of his last paintings. Um, I include it because uh, it's the coast of Stonington, Maine. And this next image is the same 
view that my sister painted. So that's Jill's uh, rendition of the Stonington Coast, and there's John's. And so they painted side by side by the water. That was the basis of their romance. It was also their career. And just to point out that that inspiration through art lives on. People are inspired by artistic depictions of nature and of water. And that art makes that feeling portable. You can take it with you when you leave the coastline by hanging it on the wall in your home. Some of the great writers and poets and singers, musicians of all time have celebrated Blue Mind. Tom Waits wrote the song Jersey Girl, Bruce Springsteen popularized, and he said, because down the shore, everything's all right. What is it about being down the shore that makes everything all right? And why does that line resonate so much? It certainly does. Carlos Argentino, a Latin American musician, said and wrote and sang, El mar la vida es más sabrosa, en el mar te quiero mucho más. Uh, at sea, life is richer, life is sweeter. At sea, I love you more. And this is a famous song throughout Latin America. Jimmy Buffett, of course, sang about the ocean quite a bit. He was very, he's very much in love with the watery environment. Mother, mother ocean, I've heard you call. I've wanted to sail upon your waters since I was three feet tall. You've seen it all. You've seen it all. I'll spare you. I won't sing it, but you know the song. Rainer Maria Rilke, uh, writer, poet, talked about how being at the water, going to the sea, was cleansing, deeply cleansing, that uh, would remove that confusion and bewilderment, uh, re hit the reset button and recenter. Um, this is not a new idea. It's one reflected throughout literature. Even in, you know, in Moby Dick, Melville writes in the opening pages about uh, when you feel that November in your soul, go to sea and you'll, you'll get rid of it. Pablo Neruda, the great Chilean poet, El hombre en el océano se desuelve como un ramo de sal, y el agua no lo sabe. And in the ocean, man dissolves like a grain of salt, and the water doesn't know. So this idea of the ocean can is so big and so powerful, and takes our problems away and makes them insignificant. The great late John John Lennon, turn off your mind, relax, and float downstream. And even modern poets getting in, into this, and you see and hear this Blue Mind message throughout literature and poetry, even now. If the ocean can calm itself, so can you. We are both salt water mixed with air. The depiction of this idea that we're in charge of our own neurochemistry, but we need to understand it in order to do it well. Big brands like Corona understand Blue Mind and they use it to sell their product, whether it's beer or tea, Here's the Nest Tea Plunge, which is a way that I used to go into the pool throughout my childhood. It's the only way I got in the water was doing that backwards Nest Tea Plunge. Pharmaceutical companies, uh, almost every pharmaceutical ad I see these days depicts people enjoying themselves near, in, on, or underwater because that is the definition of wellness. Car companies like Subaru selling cars with emotion and this connection to the ocean. This wonderful ad that shows a grandfather and a grandson going surfing together. And it, it's a Subaru ad, they're selling a car, but really they're selling a car by hooking us into our blue mind. So what's really going on here? Well, it's neurochemistry, it's happiness, it's dopamine. And you don't really get dopamine in a bottle. You get it by being outside, engaged with the world around us, being together, doing things that make you feel good, uh, reconnecting with the ocean, reconnecting with each other, maybe taking a leap in, into that deep water and pushing yourself, pushing your boundaries uh, and feeling that emotional rush. So not only have the advertisers you know, found out about Blue Mind, but we see throughout the history of Hollywood and filmmaking that water is often used as a character in film. So this film called Awakenings based on the book by Oliver Sacks, they, their movie poster is all about Blue Mind. Three Academy Awards for that one. 
it looks like seven Academy Awards for Shawshank Redemption, the, the closing scene of Shawshank Redemption, the character Red, Morgan Freeman, has finally gotten out of prison and he's walking on the beach. And he says, I hope the Pacific is as blue as it's been in my dreams. I hope. And it is, and that's the end of the film. That is the, the stunning blue mind ending of that film. Uh, more recently, Moonlight Academy Awards, eight Academy Awards, uh, and I would say Water should have won a Best Supporting Actress role. At least there should be nine Academy Awards there uh, for that film. But Water played such a central role in, in the success of this film. And The Shape of Water won 13 Academy Awards. And again, Water should have won an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress. It was central to the story, central to the beauty of the film, and it's even in the title. Eight Academy Awards for the film of Stars Born. And there's a poignant scene in the middle of this film where the character Jackson goes into rehab and Allie, played by Lady Gaga, visits and Jackson says, she says, how are you doing? And Jackson says, I've been swimming. And he's been swimming every single day while in rehab. And Allie says, that's good. It's just a pure blue mind scene right in the middle of that Academy Award winning film. We've got country music songs that celebrate this connection to water. When I hear this song by Trace Adkins, it always makes me tear up a little bit. The idea that your your girl thinks you're just fishing, but it's so much more that being being in the water together is, is really making memories, not catching fish. And this idea of Blue Mind really is ancient. It really is uh, one of the oldest, biggest ideas that humans have created goes way back. The idea that water is medicine for our bodies and our minds is not a new idea, but what we're doing is bringing new science and a new urgency to it and making it available to more people in more ways. So in summary, our brains and our bodies are hardwired to respond positively to water in ways that can improve not just our physical, but our emotional health. And our goal is for every single person to understand this basic fact about our, each of our blue minds and put it into practice throughout our lives. Thanks for listening to Blue Mind Part A. I look forward to sharing Part B with you real soon.